Gentrification Så so, uh, we have So let us start our uh, discussion About our first test Okay <coughs> So what I have observed from you by evaluating this paper is uh, you have uh, the required content to write a good answer. You have the required content. But though you have the required content, I don't know why, see there is one particular technique which uh, we need to develop as a part of uh, this main examination. <coughs> um, there is one saying in South India we used to say like this, even if you have half a glass of uh, dosa flour you need to make a big dosa without tearing it here and there okay uh, it's not like your semester examination where uh, they'll be providing you the content and uh, uh, you'll be making your answers uh, out of that not like see here is you might have studied uh, all the subject by yourself or you might have to guidance from somebody else through all these process you'll be having lot of content and how we are, for a particular question, how we are going to use this content to make an answer, that's what matters here. It is like uh, you have all the tools required to make a sculpture, okay, and you have a stone with you, and in the given time, how nice you are going to make it. So, it's not like, see, uh, nowhere that you can find questions which are straightforward, <coughs> but generally in anthropology as of now, questions remain straightforward only. They are trying to make it very complex. They are trying to <coughs> uh, confuse us, but still, <coughs> anthropology <coughs> still anthropology reminds of the same subject, same subject. For example, in this year, there was one question about uh, uh, the Harappan civilization. Indirectly, they have asked it as uh, proto history of Gujarat. Proto history. So, one need to be very clear what do you mean by proto history? What do you mean by history? What do you mean by prehistory? So, prehistory means that part of the cultural phase where uh, we do not have any written evidence and we need to reconstruct the entire cultural history based on other material remains. History means that particular cultural phase about Ashoka the Great, about Aurangzeb, or about Chandragupta Maurya. We have a number of written uh, stone inscriptions, a number of written uh, evidence from which we can reconstruct. This is history. Proto history means that particular cultural phase where we have some written evidence, but we are not in a position to discover what is written in there. Okay. Come to our uh, next. The first question was about uh, uh, neo Darwinism. To all have made uh, correct answers for this neo Darwinism, but uh, one simple thing you need to understand here Darwin propounded his theory of evolution. He was far ahead of his time because that time, even we had no knowledge about uh, genes, about uh, inheritance of occurred, inheritance of characters, or about mutation, but still, even he had some idea about uh, uh, mutation. So, during his time, the term mutation was not coined. But he was aware of that sudden genetic changes which happens in organisms and he termed it as spores. After terming it as spores, according to him, spores were least significant in evolution, according to him. But later it was proved that mutation was a very important source for evolution. And there were also a number of other drawbacks in uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Neo-Darwinism is an improvement over Darwin's theory of evolution, but there is not synthetic theory actually. This further led to the development of uh, the modern synthesis we call a synthetic theory of evolution. So, Neo-Darwinism is an improvement over Darwin's theory of evolution. So, keep in mind Darwin's theory of evolution was not rejected. It was not rejected. There were few lacunae in that. He couldn't explain few things. The most important, you also mentioned this, the source for variation. 
So Charles Darwin made it very clear that variation is the source for evolution. But he couldn't find the source for that variation. Okay. Then later after the development of Mendelian genetics, So the fusion of a Charles Darwin theory and the Mendelian genetics, right? This made the neo Darwinism, and there were few more improvements also. Like uh, so, now they have made now they had some clear idea about inheritance of character, genes, mutation, etc. And one more improvement also. See, according to Charles, Charles Darwin, he considered individual as a unit for evolution. Individual as for evolution, but later it was proved it was not individual. We should not consider individual as a source for evolution, but it was rather a population. From individual, it became population. So, neo Darwinism is an improvement over Darwin's theory of evolution. Synthetic theory of evolution it starts with the advent of molecular biology. When we start getting inputs about uh, DNA, RNA, okay, uh, uh, this is the recombinant, uh, recombinant of genetic materials. So, so, with this knowledge, right, uh, we have altogether a different set of signs. Again, we are, it's an improvement over Darwin's theory only. That we call it as a neo, sorry, synthetic theory of evolution, where uh, mutation, migration, and even isolation, isolation, see, even in neo Darwinism, they speak about uh, isolation. So, even isolation leads to speciation. Got it? Okay. Then, Kavita, can you make it 27? Then about Darwin's concept of prodigality of nature. Prodigality of nature. So we know prodigality means unlimited fertility. Every organism is not that every organism. Few organisms, there are few organisms who do not have this uh, unlimited potential. Okay. But there is no need to discuss about the negative aspects here. Simply we can mention what is prodigality. Prodigality means unlimited fertility and with few examples and how that helps in evolution. So why organisms have this unlimited potential? Okay. Okay. So next is about uh, Cope's rule. Cope's rule. Gautam, you have also made some error while well, uh, you are partially correct actually. See, Cope's rule it states that organism tends to grow in size, grow in size, but no growth is uh, uh, growth cannot be infinite. Even there is one theory called as limits to growth, which states that when resources are finite, with finite resources, growth cannot be infinite. So this theory also states that organisms tend to increase in size until nature imposes a restriction on this uh, increase in size. Okay. So this theory explains about a dinosaur and so becoming a uh, uh, exponential shape and later a minor change in the, so we know what happened to that. One classic example for that is the tiger. And most of the carnivores, tiger right, what happened in the course of uh, uh, evolution, it became larger, larger and larger and now the very large size of the tiger poses a very big threat for them. See, when a tiger, you know how difficult it is for a tiger to hunt in a forest. Once a tiger moves, birds after spotting them will give alarm call. This alarm call will be very peculiar, very peculiar. And once when you know, birds give alarm call, next monkeys, langos, they will get alerted and they will spot the tiger and they will give the alarm call. Generally, they say, generally, once when an alarm call comes, there is no need for a tiger. A tiger can think about going and hunting, simply can go and sleep. Because once when herbivores are alerted, a tiger cannot hunt. Okay. 
and generally one in a five atoms will be successful for a tiger but for the one atom drive you need to run 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 it will exhaust all the energy and by the time it hunts it right off hardly it will be left with any energy that's why most of the time after a successful hunt a tiger will face uh, challenges from vultures even uh, these wild boars they will go for competition it will not be in a position to fight with them there okay so the problem for the survival of tiger now is because of the very large size in the course of evolution it became larger and larger and larger it have reached a proportion and now nature imposes a restriction on the size increase if they further increase they will diminish they will vanish from the environment okay this is scopes rule so next is about animatism i have one doubt man when we ask about animatism why we are including animism here see make one thing very clear animatism right it is a belief in anything or anybody who is animate anything or anybody who is animate it may be anything it may be this water bottle it may be this laptop or it may be you or me it may be any it may be anything or anybody who is considered to be animate that means who is considered to be endowed with some supernatural power or force okay make one thing very clear uh, gaudam we have also mentioned about trans migration all this no option if we say trans migration it means trans migration of soul okay animatism has nothing to do with the belief in spirit or soul keep it make it very very clear if they consider that this object is sacred they worship that and they will not consider it, it is sacred because some it was occupied it is occupied by some spirit no nothing okay simply right they consider it is something supernatural they worship it that's it okay and you can give a number of examples like a monism bonga have heard about bongaism among the ho this is also one form of animatism then among the maori of new zealand they call this supernatural can supernatural impersonal force associated with objects this is an important saying about animatism so animatism deals with the supernatural impersonal supernatural forces associated with objects so you can write about r r parrot here the melanesians call it as mana melanesians right they call it as mana so they consider suppose uh, in the entire uh, oceania at least in the entire pacific islands pig is a delicious food okay everybody will be having a pig farm in their home if they find a stone which looks like a pig they will keep it in their home and they will worship it here they are not considering uh, uh, that this stone got endowed with some super soul power nothing they just believe that this will bring in some good fortune and they worship it they consider this impersonal supernatural say impersonal supernatural forces mana mana the ho of jarkar they call it as bonga the maori of new zealand call it as maori what is maori so these are examples for animatism but this animatistic belief right is found in almost even hinduism there are number of examples for animatism back in tn what people used to do um, the bricks used for construction right that brick they will uh, up here they will uh, spread turmeric on that vermilion on that and they worship that as a god so they do not think that this is endowed by some supernatural power or force simply they consider that by applying turmeric on this thing it becomes so uh, something sacred and they worship it this is animatism okay in the end r r marat says that animatistic belief was even bit more primitive than animistic belief so that's only so that is one small evolutionary part found in his theory that animatism is still more primitive when compared to animism that's the only thing which he has the end r r marat has the end got it okay. then about 
see uh, in few places so uh, uh, he contracts that but for us i will tell you there is no need to go to that debate action because in, in our syllabus things are so discrete so discrete animatism and we do not have any dualism between animism and animatism okay eb taylor rough he didn't speak anything about animatism but rr uh, marat he put forth the theory of animatism in the end he says that animatistic belief is even primitive than animistic belief that's what he says okay you can write the example of alaskan eskimos for alaskan eskimos right they consider even the glaciers to have some mana glaciers to have some mana okay fine the next is about uh, uh, mosaic evolution well tried your answer but i'll tell you but you don't have uh, some sort of clarity there in this i feel so uh, rachna she had uh, then a very correct answer for that but again there are few issues in that make it very clear mosaic means you know but a mosaic tiles right have you seen a mosaic tiles have you seen or not hmm? the floor tiles uh, made by mosaic have you heard about that how it used to be This is a mosaic type. And these are a bit harder actually. I'll show you the Boltzmann mosaic. See. This is a, a mosaic type. You have seen this. So if you say mosaic, it means something which is uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So mosaic means something which is uh, irregular. There's, okay, just they will sprinkle the chips and they will polish it. So mosaic evolution, it states that evolution is inconsistent. That is the most important thing. Evolution is inconsistent that means sometimes evolution affects the head sometimes evolution affects the locomotion sometimes evolution may not occur at all for a very long time for a very long time an organism let say organism a population may remain stable okay this is called as mosaic evolution one very good example is uh, you have mentioned about this but see what is the cradle capacity of australopithecus Homo erectus only 1000 plus. Okay. This is the cradle capacity of Australopithecus. That is saying. Uh, but uh, Australopithecus are bipedal. Bipedal. Okay. This cranial capacity is what is our cradle capacity? It is roughly 1000. Roughly around 1450, you can say. Around 1500, This is just one-fifth the cranial capacity of a human beings. But the locomotion is almost 50 percentage of that of our human locomotion. For Australopithecus. Correct? Yes or no? See, in the next stage, that means here, the evolution of locomotion was a bit fast when compared to that of a evolution of a brain. In the next stage from Australopithecus to Homo erectus, it reached a kernel capacity of 1420 cc. Okay, 1400 only. 1421 is only Narmadama. Only Narmadama. Okay, 1400 cc. And um, locomotion almost 90% is similar to that of human beings. 
So at one point of time in Australopithecus, locomotion was evolving at a faster rate. But um, not the brain. In the next stage, brain developed at a faster rate and locomotion at a smaller rate. And sometimes that evolution may not occur at all. This is mosaic evolution. The most important thing which you need to mention here is evolution is inconsistent. Okay, sometimes evolution affects uh, the head and brain. Sometimes locomotion. But sometimes evolution may not occur at all for a very long time. Okay. Then about uh, Lamar's principle of uh, inheritance of acquired characters. So, you all have written very good answers. Uh, except uh, you all missed one particular see. Uh, there are four important principles in the Lamar's theory of uh, evolution. First is uh, every organism tend to increase in size due to the internal forces. That the environmental component is here actually. We have written it separately. So this is the environmental component of his theory. Every organism tend to increase in size due to the internal forces. A small seed, if uh, uh, the environment is favorable, it can germinate and it can reach its web. Uh, you can wait there to have a look at uh, this in your uh, phone. And if there is any issue, I will call you. Okay, fine. So every organism tend to grow in size or increase in size due to the internal forces of life. First thing. Second is theory of use. Before going to theory of use and disuse, Lamarck also explains one more similar thing that is formation of a new organ. So formation of a new organ is because of your new need and the new need is maintained in the body of the organism for a long time. For example, uh, webbed digits of the ducks. That's a good example for this. Then theory of use and disuse and finally the last principle that is inheritance of acquired characters. So you have written about this very well, there is no need to explain this after. Mm, you are a bit fine in that. Then about the functionalist approach in the study of religion. See, Gimel Darkin is a sociologist, but still you can include his theory here. But when you write about Gimel Darkin, what we need to stress is one very important thing. So what is what totemism symbolizes? So, uh, worshipping of totem, what it symbolizes? It symbolizes a collective consciousness. So, one person by worshipping the totem, he worships his society. He shows his reverence towards his society. That's the most important thing here. Okay. Then, when coming to anthropologist opinion, you need to write about uh, Malinowski and the Ratcliffe Brown. So, you know, both Malinowski and the Ratcliffe Brown were contemporary. They both were inspired by each other, that you know, right? But still, they both gave the exact opposite function of religion. So, according to Malinowski, the function of religion is to relieve human mind from fear and anxiety. Relieve human mind from from fear and the anxiety so that human mind human beings can focus on single mindedly on whatever activities he is going to do correct Ratley Brown he says that the role of religion is to create fear in the minds of the people so that you can make the people to adhere to the norms established by the society so tell you an example for this uh, Islam, you know, it originated in no, the semi arid regions in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iraq, this area, Syria, Jordan. People eat a lot of meat. Lot of meat. Our human intestine is not bound to take this much stress. 
so at least once in a year if they go uh, once in a year if they go for uh, um, an intermittent fasting or this 12 hour or 14 hours fasting so we may give some time for the digestive juices to regenerate uh, and it can make the intestine healthy if a doctor prescribes that how many of them will follow but if the order is from allah i'll tell you one more example uh, beef eating in uh, north indian clients we cannot we cannot even speak the word beef there in north india right see that is a fertile plant where agriculture was a predominant economic activity and they need cattle for a variety of uh, other purposes human being we know they are very lazy okay suppose uh, there may be a crop failure because of a pest or disease outbreak once if men were left free next season they will not go and cultivate they will just cut the animal and start eating and once when they start eating they right for the next season they need cattle for a variety of purpose they need milk they need a cow dung for to make manure so simply they say do not cut the cows do not cut the cows do not eat cow do not eat how many will listen and if the order comes from religion oh now a cattle's life is of more valuable than human's life in haryana Yes or no? People will simply they will kill them actually. If they hear the, somebody speaking the word beef, they do not bother to kill them. So the role of religion is to create fear in the minds of the people so that top people will adhere to the norms established in the society. Okay. Then I have asked you to write about the separatic features of Australopithecus. So here there is no need to give any introduction about, or even if you want to give any introduction, right? You can simply mention like uh, Australopithecus, uh, was, uh, you can say was a human ancestor, or presumed to be a human ancestor, which lived roughly between four to two million years ago. Okay? And um, Australopithecus exhibited a blend of uh, human-like and uh, ape-like thing. In the time of Astro, some four million years ago, then they met a another number of fossils, fossils of few primitive monkeys, okay, or uh, chimpanzees ancestors, etc. But why we are placing this particular fossil alone in the why we are placing Australopithecus fossil alone in the line of human evolution? So there are few characters which are truly human, and that is found in Australopithecus, and these characters are not found in other uh, other fossils. But most, you know, what is the most important thing based on which we are keeping it? Yes, this is in the line of human evolution. In most of the cases, this uh, dental arcade, parabolic dental arcade. So it is based on this character only we are placing Australopithecus in the line of human evolution. <coughs> okay. So we discuss about the cephalic features. So few characters we need to make it very about Australopithecus very very prominent. For example, its cranial, cranial capacity. The next right for most of the apes, forehead will be sloping. Forehead will be sloping. Next is. Supra orbital ridges. Are they prominent? That too for Australopithecus, it runs like a thick rod there. Gautam, what is the purpose? What purpose did the supra orbital ridge serve? Why did these apes have these huge supra orbital ridges in their uh, above their eyes? They had very large mandible, right? Very large mandible. And they used to bite, bite, bite and chew using this mandible. So this truss will straight away fall on the forehead. So here if the bones are weak, these bones may crumble. So the supraorbital ridge is developed as a reinforcement in this region to protect uh, these bones against the heavy activity of lower jaw. Okay. Then you uh, uh, can write about foramen magnum. Foramen magna. 
and the evolutionary significance of pheromone background. So, for primitive apes, it used to be you, your name is Raghu. For primitive apes, it used to be more posterior, and in the course of evolution, it became more centrally placed. Okay, because in animals, when they had the uh, uh, quadrupedal locomotion. Vertebral column used to be single arched like this. Single arch and foramen magnum used to be more central. In the course of evolution, this became more, uh, more centrally placed, and for weight bearing modification, the vertebral column became multiple arched. And remember, in the case of Australopithecus, the vertebral column was not perfectly arched like this. This we call it as anticlinal vertebra. So, uh, the backbone of Australopithecus shows some curvature in uh, this region alone. What is, this, what is this region called as? L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, lumbar region. In lumbar region alone, that curve was uh, very prominently visible. So, it means that uh, they were reaching, they just started evolving towards achieving that uh, perfect bipedal locomotion and the right posture. Got it? So, about this foramen magnum, we can write. Then, uh, we can also write about uh, uh, prognathism. So, what do you mean by prognathism? Prognathism means uh, protrusion of uh, this uh, oral cavity forward. So, this happened due to two important reasons. One, it is uh, large and massive mandible and flat nasal bridge. So, uh, face used to be a bit concave and this oral cavity was projected forward. Okay, this prognathism. Got it right? Then, uh, uh, Rachna, she wrote about few more interesting things. Uh, she wrote about occipital condyles. What is this occipital condyle? Forget about these things. What is a condyle first? A condyle, see they say condyle in anatomy, this refers to an articulation surface which forms an attachment, not attachment actually, an artic it forms an articulation surface with another bone that we call it as a condyle. Okay, so here we have one condyle. So using a condyle, right, this bone gets attached here. We have one condyle in femur. I'll show you one in the condyle. This is a condyle. This is a condyle. So, this particular thing is rounded, uh, right? It forms uh, an articulation surface with uh, the another bone. Okay. It, it, it will be like this, but it do not be completely get locked here. Muscles will surround this and it will hold it. This is called as a condyle. Okay. So, uh, in anatomy, we need to know two important things what is condyle and what is a process? The term process. So, we say condylite process, coronoid process. So, we say process that refers to protrusion of a bone or a tissue from a larger mass. That we call it as a process. This two term remember, condyle process. Okay. So, occipital condyles means uh, these are found on uh, either on uh, or the sides of uh, foramen magna. See, can you see these, uh, these two? These are the occipital condyles. These two are the occipital condyles. This provides extra support and uh, articulation for the head in a different angle. For the earlier head was held in a different angle. Now, the foramen magnum was here. Now, it is here. Now, the head need to be articulated in a different way. So, the occipital condyles are uh, um, these are not so prominent in the case of quadrupedal animals. For Australopithecus, it is very prominent in occipital contents. And one more thing also you can uh, uh, add here, that is the uh, 
occipital condyles one more thing even mastoid process what is process if you have doubt you can also write it down so process in anatomy refers to process in anatomy refers to the protrusion of protrusion protrusion of a bone or a tissue bone or a tissue from a larger mass it may be a bone or it may be a tissue okay. So this mastoid process, this is also an important prominent uh, feature of Australopithecus head. I'll show you why it's a mastoid. See behind our ears, you can see one triangle shaped bone, triangle shaped bone. So that is mastoid process. And even now, uh, this provides attachment area for few muscles. So from here, the muscles goes into the lower jaw and gets attached to here. So this biting and sinning, even now, this mastoid process plays uh, some role. So this is mastoid process. Got it? Mastoid process. Got it? Okay. And absence of chin. So until Neanderthals or uh, prior to Neanderthals, none of our ancestors had chin. Even chin, right? Uh, why this chin developed? So when the mandible become very smaller and smaller in compared to Australopithecus, Homo erectus or human beings, it was becoming thinner and stiffer. Still, it need to be strong in this region. So this curvature developed as a reinforcement to provide extra strength in this region. Okay, fine. Then I asked you to write about weakness in the Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's theory, weakness. Uh, so, the very important weakness is uh, he was very well aware that uh, variation is the source for evolution but what is the source for variation he couldn't find that so what is the source for the variation he couldn't identify that got it uh, even about uh, mutation He had idea about the mutation, but at that time the term mutation was not kind, the term gene was not kind. So he termed the sudden change in uh, the sudden change in the organism as spores. And spores are often least significant in evolution. But later it was proved that mutation is a very important source in evolution. Okay. The next is uh, so he consider individual as an unit for evolution. But in later studies, it shows very clearly we should not use individual as a unit for evolution, but rather a population. So population should be a unit for evolution. But here he said, individual as a unit for Or evolution. Okay. Okay. 
next is uh, he spoke about survival of the fittest but not about the uh, arrival of the arrival of the fittest <coughs> you want an example for arrival of the fittest is in lantana camera Hmm. Lantana camera is a very common, all might have seen this. It's a very common plant in the rural side. Ah, correct. You might have seen this, right? This plant is not native to India. From Central America, we have a introduce this plant for ornamental purpose but many say even this is uh, a controversy sorry so this is a uh, uh, conspiracy actually to introduce this plant into our country so now if you go to any forest there are three weed species all the three invasive which dominates one is lantana camera another one is parthenia another one is uh, eupatorio Parthenium and I will show you this Eupatorium plant. This is in uh, na these plants are uh, Euphotorium. This is in uh, Nagarpale National Park. Okay, we are a part of uh, tiger sensors uh, and we are moving there. See, look at how this dominates this Euphotorium. This is the invasive species, this will not allow other plants to grow there. Hmm? One second, you can see this uh, lantana inside this. See the bushes through which so we will be going through these bushes. In fact, here it is a bit uh, open, it will be so closed. closed. Here, these all are parthenia, the sides. So, not parthenia, this one, uh, lantana camera. This lantana camera, right, this contains a lot of. Uh, Thorns and uh, herbivores cannot feed this thing. And this is a very big threat in our uh, forest now, this invasive species. So these are examples for arrival of the fetus. They came here, they uh, and they started spreading, and we don't have any control over this thing. So this also changes uh, uh, the population. Okay. So, he didn't speak about the arrival of the fetus. So, these are the major drawbacks in the Darwin's theory of evolution. Let's say drawback. Even he himself was far ahead of his time. Okay. And he couldn't think about this thing during those times. So, later, that's why his theory was not disregarded completely. It was subsequently improved by the subsequent workers. Then, uh, I asked, is myth a system of form? Uh, Uranus and the illusory belief. Let us have a look at that red symbol is coming there, the battery. Is myth a system of is it okay? Uranus and the And illusory belief. I will give a copy of question to you after this. Okay. See, Radcliffe Brown, he says that myth is a system of fairness and illusory belief. This is Radcliffe Brown's statement. 
But Malinowski, though he is a contemporary of Rutley Brown, he clarifies that saying, myth is not a savage speculation. Myth is not a speculative storytelling. Myth has the you know, unlimited function in the society. So myth, serve, myth has a number of purposes to serve. For example, in few societies, myth serves as a charter for the presence of many institutions. So one way by which people can establish a social order is through myth. See, nowadays, right, uh, uh, kids have a variety of avenues to play. So see how things are changing in a matter of 20-30 uh, uh, years. So during our childhood days, so once we came, once we come back from school, we'll throw our books, we'll change our uniform, then we'll go out for playing. Until sun, until it becomes dark, right? We'll be busy playing, and our parents will have a tough time in pulling us back to home. But now parents are finding it very tough to push the kids out of the home when they are glued to the gadgets here. How things are changing was bad talk. Some 60, 70 years back, until some 60, 70 years back, uh, when uh, in villages, at least at city, were not so common. During those times, right, kids, uh, once it becomes dark, they'll come back to home. And until dinner, uh, their grandparents will be entertaining them. So they'll be telling a number of stories from these uh, myths from Mahabharata, uh, Ramayana. And this is an age-old process, which vanished now. It is not there anywhere now. So by indirectly instructing the kids about is Ramayana or Mahabharata, what they are doing here is uh, indirectly, right, they are instructing the kids about the moral values, about the ethical norms, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, etc. etc. By speaking about Ramayana from childhood itself, they make it sure that uh, if somebody is having disease over somebody else's wife, okay, it is uh, uh, he will be considered as a Ashura. Mahabharata even speaks about gambling, the evil is about gambling, even now it is true, right? Okay, so apart from this, apart from the storytelling, everything, it was a very, very, very big achievement by, by these scholars, by our rock forefathers who made all the myth. How nicely they have made it, see, they have made the story, they have inducted number of uh, characters into that, so that, right, the, the story becomes so interesting. Bhima, Arjuna, Lord Krishna, okay, about Bhima and his power. So kids will be glued to this, right? Then a very big action sequence in the end, not in the beginning, in the end. That's why, right, Mahabharata and Ramayana were very famous and not Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so they have made Ramayana and Mahabharata as a myth, and all the required norms are found there in this itself. So how clever they should be in making this and even now, see 2000 years back they made this myth and even now if there is a serial about Mahabharata Ramayana, even now people are going and sitting and watching that. On the other hand, the movies made by even be it Rajni Gandhi or Dikita Amitabha after 10 years that we won't watch that, yes or no. So this is the utility of myth and as an anthropologist, we are not here to search truth behind the myth, behind the myth. We are here to focus only what a myth symbolizes, what a myth symbolizes. That's what important for us. So what purpose a myth is serving, that's what important for us. So can you explain this? So according to Radcliffe Brown, so Radcliffe Brown, he says that myth is a system of Piranus illusory belief. So Malinowski, he clarifies that the myth will be believed by the people to whom it belongs. The same Ratli Brown will not say that Bible is a myth. Because as it belongs to him, he believes in that. But on the other hand, he considers others myth or primitive people's myth as the, a system of erroneous and the illusory belief. That is true. Then by all probability, Australopithecus were bipedal. 3C. Australopithecus were bipedal. Substantiate this statement with the anatomical evidence. So by doing this, right, one more small portion of syllabus also gets uh, <coughs> covered. There is uh, anatomical changes due to erect posture and its implications. So here, we need to be very, very careful what we need to write here. So anatomical evidence to show that Australopithecus were bipedal. The first evidence is uh, the most centrally placed uh, form on Magna. 
then curve in the lumbar region. Next one particular thing you all missed to write is about the pelvis, which is bowl shape. See how the pelvis is for us. It is a bowl shaped, right? On the other hand, for animals with a quadrupedal locomotion, it is to be plate like. It is to be plate like. So, when you got erect posture and it still remained as a plate, it will be there in the front side of the stomach. It will not serve any purpose. So, the function of pelvis is to hold the organs above it. So, the plate shaped pelvis became bowl shaped, which is a very important indication of. Uh, Correct posture and bipedal locomotion. Then <coughs> have a look at this picture. <coughs> Can you look at the angle here? The femur bone is not straight, but it is held at an angle. See, but here it is almost straight. This is, uh, I think, the pelvis of uh, a chimpanzee, hopefully. So this is straight here. But for us, can you see the angle? This is called as torsion angle of the femur. Torsion angle of the femur. Torsion angle of the femur. See here. This acts like a spring. When there is excessive weight low, right, it can just compress and it can relax lightly. This is a weight bearing modification. Instead, if it is straight, then the entire body weight will fall on the knee. Okay, on the knee. So that's why this is one weight bearing modification. Even for Australopithecus, this is a torsion angle was present. Torsion angle of the femur. Then we need to elaborate about the linear aspera. One paragraph you can write about the linear aspera. So what is linear aspera? Linear aspera is the tail gautam, you know. I'll tell you also from quadrupedal locomotion, we got bipedal locomotion. From quadrupedal locomotion, we got a bipedal locomotion. Earlier, this small body weight will be, even there was an increase in body weight over evolution. Okay. So, the small body weight will be managed by four limbs. But when you got erect posture, even the body weight become more during evolution and the entire body weight need to be balanced by only hind limbs and the entire body weight will be made to fall if it is again right up. There are number of modification in the ankle and in the feet. That's why this entire body weight will not be made to fall in a single place. If our entire body weight is made to fall exactly there uh, in the feet at one point, that's why we cannot bear the weight. Our entire body weight in the feet will be made to radiate into the feet. For example, suppose if this is the feet. The weight load starts here. It moves in this line. It comes by and it goes on the ends here. Our entire body weight will be made to radiate into the feet, but not to fall. If it is made to fall in one single place exactly here, we cannot bear the weight. So there are number of modifications for this. Number of modifications. That's why, right? Many criticize that of wearing a high heels, right? After nothing actually. That is an extension of this. Nothing will happen because of wearing high heel at all. Okay. There's no need to bother. 
You have already write our weight will be made to radiate, it will not fall in a single place. Okay. So then we have say, uh, okay. So now the entire body weight need to be balanced by uh, hind limbs alone. So now there is extra burden here, right? So to bear this extra burden, some extra muscles got developed here in this region, in the abdomen and in the thigh region. So new muscles means we need to have some attachment area for muscles in the bone, right? I heard about attachment areas, attachment surface in bone. Attachment areas, very simple, man. Same. Uh, how many of you are non vegetarian? You all are right. There's nothing wrong in saying I'm a non vegetarian, right? So if you eat a leg piece of a chicken, Okay, they will uh, uh, fry it in tandoori or somewhere. <laughs> See, we can eat of uh, the flesh here easily. And towards the end, there will be some flesh which will be attached in this area alone, which we cannot pull it out easily. Okay. And even suppose if you manage to pull it out, right, at the end, the suppose if you see a dried bone, uh, you can see some rough patches here. These rough patches, right, these are the attachment areas. It is here the muscles get attached. See, uh, think about uh, the poultry birds, the chicken. Okay, almost we are cultivating it like a plant. Hardly we will allow them to walk or fly. And even for these birds, when this attachment is so strong, think about the human being. Okay, so these are the attachment areas. So once when no, new muscles got developed in the abdominal region, so we need extra attachment areas. Even in fact, I forgot to tell you one thing about the cephalic uh, features of Australopithecus, because sagittal crust. Kiran, you mentioned that sagittal crust is absent in Australopithecus. Even for human beings, sagittal crust is still there. Uh, the Eskimos uh, in Alaska, the Inuits, the Samoids uh, who live in the Arctic region, still they have a small primitive form of, a rudimentary form of sagittal crust. So sagittal crust we know on the top of the head, right? Uh, it's a ridge-like oh, bone here. And what purpose did that serve? Why they had this uh, sagittal crust? See, uh, Australopithecus and the apes before the Triopithecus or Oreopithecus, they were forced to eat raw meat. They need to bite, bite, bite and chew that. So for that, they need to have excessive masticatory apparatus for biting and chewing. So there are many muscles. In fact, two muscles which play a major role in biting and chewing. The one is a masseta, another one is temporalis. Masseta, another one is Temporalis. I will show this. The one in the bottom. So this is the masseta, this is the temporalis. Okay. Even uh, this temporalis, it passes through one bone, this bone. About this bone also, we can write about uh, this bone also in uh, the facial features of Australopithecus. What is this bone called as? This bone. Mm. What is this bone called as Kavita? Zygomatic arch. This bone is the zygomatic bone. This is a zygomatic arch. This is zygomatic bone. This is zygomatic arch. Okay, what is this called as? 
This is the mastoid process. Mm. Are you comfortable with the term process? So, process in anatomy refers to a protrusion of a bone or a muscle from a larger mass. So, here this a bone, it projects from a larger mass. That's why we call it this a larger mass. And when bone projects here, that's why we call it as mastoid process. Are you okay with the term condyle? Because when we discuss this thing, um, Heidelberg jaw. So there we discuss a lot about the coronoid process and the condylite process. So you know condyle, condyle means this is an articulation surface of one bone where it gets attached to the other bone, articulation surface of a bone. That is called as condyle, condylite process, condyle, okay. So uh, this uh, for us, right, this masseter and temporalis are like this. But for Australopithecus, they had a large and massive jaw, they need to bite and chew a lot. So, both the muscles were uh, so huge and these were extended, this temporalis were extended further and uh, it was attached to this sagittal crest. Got it? So, the sagittal crest provided attachment areas for the temporalis muscle. So that's why in the course of evolution, when we started eating processed food, lower jaw became smaller and need for that excessive masticatory apparatus declined and now there is no need to have this excessive temporalis and uh, this one also vanished. But people who live in Arctic region, they still continue to rely on meat. Most of the time, right, uh, they, I don't know whether they will be in a position to heat and roast the meat and eat. There are few eateries in Bengaluru uh, which serve raw meat. I heard about that raw meat. Uh, there is one eatery in uh, number one MG Road Mall, right? Called as Toe Terrace. Number one MG Road Mall near Alsur, that is uh, in the end of that uh, MG Road, right? Near the Trinity Metro. In the top, we have these uh, Toe Terrace. This is a Japanese eatery. If you go there, 60% of the meat they serve are only processed but not cooked. Hmm? Not like sushi actually. Uh, that meat itself, that meat itself, right, they serve fish. That is just processed but they won't cook it. They won't cook it in oil or they won't boil it. Just a processed thing. Okay. Okay, come back. So, are you okay with uh, sagittal crust, these two muscles, masseter and temporalis? Fine, then. So, are you okay with uh, the concepts like the, uh, the anatomical things like attachment areas? Okay. So, to provide excessive attachment areas for the muscles in the abdominal and thigh region, a small groove developed in the back side of the femur bone, not the front side, only the back side, you can see. This is called as linea aspera. The back side is developed, back side of the femur bone, this groove. So, this groove, right, this rough groove provided attach attachment area for the muscles in the thigh region. Got it? So, if this groove is there, then what is the need? Excessive muscles here. It implies excessive muscles. That means these organisms had erect posture or these shapes had erect posture. So, presence of linea aspera is something very important. Then, straight knees and a number of weight bearing modification in the ankle and the feet, like arching of bones. Do you want me to explain this arching of bone? You know this, right? See, here in our feet, the bone will not be straight like this, but it will be arched like this. This is a weight bearing modification. And for a few, right, this arching may not be perfect, and we call them as flat foot. And flat foot, right, is a disqualification for uniform cervix. Uh, like uh, IPS, IRS, Customs and Excise, uh, even IRTS, I think. They will, uh, in the medical examination, they will do that one. See that uh, personality test is a bit okay. You can just go there to take one day. Next day, in the name of conducting medical examination, right, from morning, 9 o'clock till evening, 5 o'clock, they will torture us like anything. <laughs> Too many tests in a single day. And uh, one in, for the test for uh, this flat food, there will be one doctor. He will, there will be in his chamber, there will be some column of water. He will ask you to step into that and step on the dry area. Then he will have a look. 
So the impression should be our feet should be like this. If it is uh, like this, uh, then okay, flat foot. <laughs> okay, then. So now are you okay with um, uh, linear aspera? Good. So make it sure that when they ask you to write about uh, the anatomical evidence to show that Australopithecus are bipedal, make it very clear. Centrally placed the foramen magnum. Though the vertebral column was not perfectly arched like human beings, still there is a curve in the lumbar region alone, the lumbar region. Okay. Then the pelvis, see, even there are many more things, there is no need to go that deep actually. Even the position of vertebral spines. If you have a look at the vertebral column, right, uh, some button button like uh, uh, spines will be there in the back. So even the position of the vertebral uh, spines, right, uh, even it, uh, there is an evolutionary change in that. So it used to be, uh, sometimes it used to point back and sometimes it used to uh, bend downward. There is no to go that extent actually. Okay. Then broad uh, bowl shaped uh, broad pelvis. Then presence of torsion angle in the femur bone. Then uh, linea aspera. See, then everywhere we have, in vertebral column we have curve. In femur bone we have curve. If everywhere there is curve, then what about uh, stability? So, knees were straight. And then uh, ankle and modification. So, this provides stability for us when we stand. Along with few muscles in the abdominal region. Gluteus medius and gluteus, three muscles, gluteus medius, gluteus maximus and gluteus minimus. So, we will explain about that in next question. Okay, then take us number four. According to Franz Bose, totemism exhibited no single psychological or historical origin. Um, one thing I would like to tell you see, though every single question carries equal marks, there are few questions which will be tricky. And which will be very important. Our examiner will expect whether you have answered those questions or not. These are key questions, and every question paper there will be some three, four key questions like this. And if you can identify this, you should answer that. You should not leave it in charge. Okay. Uh, we know about totemism. Right? There is no doubt in that. What is totemism? Okay. Uh, so though Emil Durkheim he did lot of work about totemism, he couldn't provide a scientific explanation about what this totemism is. So, until the publication of one famous article by Golden Weiser, Alexander Golden Weiser, until then nobody had good idea about uh, what this uh, totemism is. But he makes it very clear that Golden Weiser totemism is associated with clan, exogamy, people taking uh, names and labels out of uh, plants and animals. Considering them as their ancestors, they will go for uh, periodic collective worshipping of this totem, etc. etc. Okay, he codifies what is totemism. But let it was Franz Bosch, he says that uh, totemism is not such a religion which has one single common historical origin. Okay, the aspects of totemism may be found scattered here and there. For example, in one society, we may have the first three, and the last three may be missing. In another society, the last four may be the top two may be missing. So we cannot codify it into we cannot codify totemism into one particular religion, totemism into one particular religion, because the aspects of totemism may be found scattered here and there in many religions. So that's what Franz Boas finally concludes about a totemism. Okay. So apart from that, are you okay with the other aspects of totemism? So how it is associated with the clan, but not or not with the lineage. And then where these people cannot uh, demonstrate their ancestors, they can only stipulate. If you have any doubt in the totemism alone, you cannot take uh, risk actually. If you have any doubt, you tell me. Okay, even we have made few lectures about this thing. So slowly I can just uh, show that in the projector there. Okay. So if you have doubt in any topic, you please come and ask me. So all our lectures are there with us. Okay. So whenever our, uh, the next classroom is free, I can uh, screen it there. Okay. Fine. Then... So, though Australopithecus had a bipedal locomotion, it was not physiologically an efficient way of walking. Why? Yeah, change it.
So now you can leave if you want. It is 5.30. Huh? Please do. Okay, hurry up. No, we don't have class, but come, we have some other work. We'll see you on Monday. So you know that uh, Australopithecus are bipedal, but uh, the bipedal locomotion of Australopithecus was different than that of uh, human beings, right? How it is different? Why it is different? Forum and magnum was not exactly the center. Then. Okay, I'll tell you. See, uh, the locomotion of bipedal locomotion of Australopithecus, it was neither knuckle walking, it is called as jog trot like walk. Jog trot like walking. That means they'll jog, jog trot, they'll, they'll stand with the bend knees and bend heel. They cannot stand straight. They will stand like this. Both the abdomen will be bent, knees will be bent, like this they will stand. Okay, they will stand like that. And like that they cannot walk continuously. Some quick fast steps, some four or five steps, again they will stand. You just try to stand like that and walk, how painful it will be. So this is physiologically inefficient actually. It needs a large output of energy. Three times more than what of the energy which we use for walking. And this was because of a few reasons. The first important is uh, mere absence of uh, gluteus medius, so gluteus uh, maximus, and gluteus uh, minimus. So these are the muscles which stabilize our pelvis when we walk. So we are standing at because of this muscle. I'll show where these muscles are. Gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus will be here between these. So, this muscle, right, this is the muscle which stabilizes our pelvis when we walk. We are walking properly because of these muscles only. These muscles were almost nil, just, just developing this walk. This is one problem. Next problem is uh, again, here happens of gluteus maximus, gluteus medius. Okay, then
ischium bone. We call it as ischial tuberosity. Ischial tuberosity. This bone is there in the anterior region of the pelvis, and this bone is very short for us. But for animals with a quadrupedal locomotion, this bone used to be very long. For Australopithecus, this bone still continued to remain long. That means it just climbed down from the trees. Australopithecus are the first ape to walk on the ground. So that's why its anatomy has yet to reach that threshold for perfect walking. Okay. This is GM bone. This is the issue of bone, this one. This is a bit very long for Australopithecus, like. Huh? So these are huh, the anatomical issues because of which Australopithecus had a jog trot like locomotion and this jog trot like locomotion is physiologically inefficient as it requires huh, large output of energy. It needs to consume a lot of energy. Okay, for the particular pocket. Okay, fine. Next is variation is the important source in the evolution. Variation is the important source for evolution. Nothing to substantiate this with of examples, right? Was there any variation in Australopithecus? There were two, right? Grazil and the robust. Somewhere around 2 million years ago, there was a change in climate and change in environmental condition. So, there was a scarcity for vegetarian food. Robust was strictly vegetarian. Uh, what was the anatomical evidence we have to show that robust was strictly vegetarian? Molar. Hmm? Dental. Hmm, teeth only. Yes, I'll tell you all. Teeth is bound to get attrition. Okay, the teeth will wear out, no doubt. There is one teeth, so there is a greater wearing pattern. Around that, there is no much. Uh, Attrition. We know grazil is omnivorous. Grazil, what it eats, it ate meat as well as fruits, nuts, etc. Robust was strictly vegetarian. Then tell me A, B. Which one is uh, robust teeth? You all say B because you all are against a non veg food, right? You are, this is one problem with Indians, man. We all think that our culture is inferior, other culture is superior. See, A is the uh, uh, robust teeth. I'll tell you why. It's visible to you, right? Okay. Most of the vegetations contain silica. Tubers and even few fruits, nuts contain silica. Silica is capable of creating major attrition to the teeth when compared to that. Uh, Dentally. So, gray cell it was omnivorous. There is not a problem with the meat actually. Hardly there any silica in meat. They can eat that. But because of the presence of silica in vegetarian food, the teeth of robustus had a greater wearing pattern. So, by this only I identified robustus are strictly vegetarian while uh, gray cell were omnivorous. So, when there was a change in climate, gray cell because it was short and slender, and uh, it can switch over to any food habit. It survived. 
on the other hand robust term in ecological term we call it we call robust as a specialist grazing as a generalist specialist means they have yeah, only a very narrow range of food habits on the other hand generalist they have a wide range of food habits so robust became extinct and grazing got further evolved into homo habilis we know this right here what is the source for variation say what is source for evolution variation so had there been no variation had the entire population been robust then what might have happened the entire population might have vanished and had there been the fully completely grazing it might have remained as grazing there might have been any evolution at all so variation is the very important source for evolution so you can substantiate that with a number of examples so this example you can give okay fine then uh, about parallelism in evolution i don't know why you are getting confused here so make it very clear this organism we are going to discuss about two organisms in parallelism okay so one both the organisms might have had a common ancestor but long back long back so they had a common ancestor here this common ancestor might have developed into different species over time this speciation might have continued and uh, further 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 and now there is one species and here there is one species few million years maybe some 60 70 or 80 million years have uh, transgressed in between so both these organisms a and b they had a common ancestor the distant past but they got evolved in different line but even after few million years of evolution as different species there may be few characters which may still remain same among the two species which we call it as parallelism the very good example for this is uh, the cephalic features of uh, human beings and uh, tamarind monkeys have a look at a tamarind monkey if you take a skull of a tamarind monkey and the skull of your human baby you cannot distinguish between the two most of the cranial features will look alike we look alike so this is a monkey no doubt we human beings had a common ancestry with monkey but uh, some 120 billion years ago itself that line got split okay that line got split and um, but now still there is uh, uh, one similarity between uh, human beings and tamarind monkey this we call it as parallelism got it parallelism okay then parallels on the psychic unity of mankind i don't think there is a need for me to explain this because you all have given a very good answer for this psychic unity of mankind parallelism and psychic unity of mankind uh, given the similar environment given the similar environment and if two populations remain in same type of socio economic development then the thinking will be similar the struggle will be similar then no, innovations will also be similar okay if there is a so for example pygmies in congo basin they also use a bow and arrow to hunt the sentinel is in andaman nicobar island they also use uh, bow and arrow the sea mice in malaysia they also use bow and arrow the sentinel is didn't go to congo to learn this technique so these are examples for independent innovations okay are you okay with this and how he used uh, this in his theory e beetle used it, it is e beetle who developed this concept right security point right security of mankind survivals and parallels then source other and which source other and which see there is one critical difference between these two which you need to understand okay see a source other may be a female or a male 
but which is generally which is our only feedback a sorcerer uses a number of materials a number of materials like uh, the human skull some bone uh, crystal rock they have she shells with the then uh, this uh, starfish then sun fried rice uh, mixed in turmeric all these things they'll keep while doing the performance on the other hand witches will not use any materials will not use any materials and their activities will be in the form of thought and expression only so it will be a normal woman and uh, if somebody knows she is a witch if you go and ask her it will okay evening come to my home let us do it then uh, evening she will transform herself into a witch she will look altogether different and here again she will not be using any material everything will be in the form of thought and emotion she will shout yeah that guy right he will die tomorrow then after some time right she will become normal and she will take her uh, fees for that and she will let her with him go okay so that's why there will be a large scale witch hunting which there's some saying actually uh, in the primitive societies there will be large scale witch hunting without any effect without any result so they cannot prove that somebody is a witch this is a major difference between sorcerer and witch but to what extent witchcraft affects the primitive people i'll show one small example to show to what extent witchcraft actually creates fear panic among the people Can you read this? State level consultation on witch hunting organized by Assam or something. See, when you Indian Institute of Bank Management, <laughs> to some ex to this extent, right, witchcraft is capable of influencing the life of the people. See, India's witches, victims of superstition and poverty. Whatever happens there. They say it is because of witchcraft. If it is not raining, there is a drought. They say it is because of witchcraft. If somebody after getting married, that lady didn't conceive. They say it is because of witchcraft. Okay, fine then. So this one difference, right? When they ask me about sorcerer and witch, this one particular important difference we need to highlight it. So a witch will not. That's why we don't have any identifying a sorcerer is not a big issue. They can identify and they can kill him. But identifying a witch is very very difficult. That's why witch hunting is something very common in most of the primitive society. And uh, among the Alaska Eskimos, witchcraft is a very big crime, and uh, many take it as a important profession there. Cotton witch hunting. Then, uh, uh, I asked you to write about hunting and gathering tribes in India. So we can write some hunting, and you wrote about uh, the Chinchos. Uh, that's correct, actually. Okay, uh, but Yurulas. Uh, did you mention about Yurula tribe? Yurulas actually they are uh, snake charmers. Uh, they are hunters and gatherers. Uh, they uh, they'll uh, they do collection foraging, but not professional hunters. They are these two uh, professional snake charmers. They are. I had uh, one of my senior in my college who is a Yurula tribe. Every year during our uh, college cultural festival, he used to bring some um, 10, 15 snakes from his uh, village, and uh, there will be one snake dance in the auditorium. <laughs> okay, some 10 guys will hold that in their hand uh, and they'll be dancing with that. And once it was, uh, I got so terrified on that day. I was just, cra I had no clue about it. I was just crossing his row. Suddenly, I saw some six, seven uh, snakes eating like this, uh, and this guy was feeding chicken. Uh, he, he, he eat like that. I went there and said, "Hey, do not worry, man. We are removed all the all the poisonous teeth. They do not, they are not poisonous. Do not worry." <laughs> Good that they didn't leave any snake while dancing. 
And even in Orissa, once I think in 2002, I think there was an issue. Uh, the tribal people they were pressing for some legislation, uh, and uh, the government they were, were so reluctant. And once they said, uh, if you are not going to do it uh, tomorrow, we are going back to our village. Uh, we will bring snakes and we will leave it into the assembly. <laughs> then they took a number of precautionary steps by this one. Uh, oleic acid is a natural repellent. Oleic acid, oleic acid powder. They brought it uh, and they spread it across the assembly. These guys also next day they came with snakes, huge huge snakes. But they said we are not so rude like you people. They just uh, left it in the street on the road, holding it. And they took a photo and they just went back. Okay, fine. Uh, the proto astralite tribes, good man, you are written nicely. Okay, Santas, Munda, they are the proto astralites. Okay, and uh, okay, Kutma six. So. Uh, nobody wrote this. I expected you to write this. I will brief you what this is. So, briefly discuss how E.B. Taylor used the concept of survival to explain his theory of culture. First of all, what do you mean by survival? Survivals are outdated customs, which after losing its utility, still it may remain in our society. So, uh, every aspect of the culture has its own function. And few aspects of culture, after losing its function, it will vanish from the system. But few aspects of culture, even after losing its functional utility, it may still remain in our system. We call it as a survival. I'll tell you one example. Uh, typewriter. How many of you have seen a typewriter? Have you heard about a typewriter? Where did you see last? In court, right? See, in court and district office complexes, some 20 years back, if you go, there will be a minimum of 10 to 20 shops where, uh, see, think about the skill of those people, man, how fast they die without any error. Now, even if you give the computer where you can change, right, people are making, uh, that skill we have lost it, actually. And there will be a number of training centers uh, to train the people in typing. Hardly we have any thing now. Okay. So, typewriter has lost its utility. It vanished from nowhere you can see typewriter and only in museums you can see that. Then about photo cameras. Some 20 years back where we used to have film rolls. Uh, everything right. Uh, now hardly we use that we have digital thing and it vanished from the system. Hardly we can now uh, see this thing. So every aspect after losing its function right will vanish from the system. But there are few aspects. Hmm? Hmm? Which one? Huh? Okay. Portrait. Uh -huh. Now they are using because it has lost the function, right? See, similarly, there are few things which even after losing its functional utility still remains in our system. For example, our Gaudam, he is wearing a wristwatch. Is there any function for that man? Now it is having a different function. But uh, the general analog watches, we can still see few people wearing it. Our Siddharamaya, some six years back, he was wearing one this cobalt watch uh, and that led him into controversy. And there was a huge story behind uh, from where that wristwatch came. From somewhere from Dubai, somebody gave it to somebody and finally without any idea, <laughs> this guy was wearing that. <laughs> See, that is, a, see, hardly there is any function now attached with that. See, our mobile phone gives us a very correct uh, time now. Okay, if you wear that, uh, they will not allow us to examination. They will not allow us for even now. So, listen, uh, these are examples. There are many examples for, see, even now, lighting of a lamp inside the puja hall. That is an example for survival. Now, we have one this neon lamps. So, Okay, LED lamps or even this plasma lamps which glows like a flame. We can use that, right? Still, we are following the old tradition of filling oil and lighting the lamp. That had lost the functional utility, but still we are doing it, right? These are examples for survivals in our society. The coat which men wear. In the back side of the coat, there will be a fold. Have you seen that? Shall I show one? Shall I show one? That's in the back side of the coat. Okay. 
Side, there is a fold here, right? This fold, right? When you are when you used to ride horses, it has some buttons of that use. That fold at least, uh, the button at least, when we walk, we will uh, put that button on. But the folds are meant for uh, meant to be for comfort when we are using the right horse. But now we are not riding ourselves. But still, that fold remains. This is an example for survival. Okay. Uh, according to E.B. Taylor, survival indicates the condition of the past. Correct? Survival indicates the condition of the past. So it is using the survival only. Uh, he said that. Uh, Human culture evolved from savagery to barbarism and barbarism to civilization. So, how survival indicates the condition of the past? He gives one example of the custom of COVID. Kiran, what is COVID, Kiran? It is one peculiar custom. See, this custom is still practiced by few tribes in the central Indian tribal bit. The hose, this waran, they still practice uh, this custom. Here, once when uh, uh, after getting married, if a person's wife becomes uh, pregnant, trouble will be more for him than uh, his wife. He need to imitate the behavior of his wife. So there will be a number of purification rituals, uh, and he need to undergo all those things. So when uh, she walks like this, right, even he need to hold his hand and he need to walk, and. Uh, Correct. And once when she goes to labor bed for delivery, even they will dump some cloth into his dress, even he need to pretend as if he is uh, delivering. Okay. So, this he, he need to, if she cries, even he need to cry. He need to cry loudly. So, this peculiar custom is called as COVID. Uh, according to E.B. Taylor, marriage as an institution, marriage or family, it evolved like this. Initially, it was matrilineal. Later, it got the course of time, it got evolved into matri, patri. And when human society reached the most civilized stage, it became patrilineal. This we know, right? During matrilineal stage, there was no need for man to practice COVID because man had no roles, no responsibilities, nothing. And even if he wants to do, they say, hey, you get lost. We'll manage everything. So he had even, they won't even give too much of rights to our parentage. He cannot ask his kid, hey, can you do this for me, can you do this for me. Kids will be always attached to their mother only. Okay. It all happened during matripatrilineal stage of evolution. When men wanted to ascertain the right to our parentage. So see, I have also suffered a lot like your mother. I am also your equal parent. So you should, I also have um, roles and responsibilities, okay, you also have some responsibility over me, okay, just go and buy cigarette for me. They can ask the kids to do this thing, got it? So, COVID started in matripatrilineal society and uh, when it became purely patrilineal, now there is no need for men to practice this COVID, right? But still in some society, COVID is prevalent as a survival. So that's why this survival indicates the condition of the past. So this is how E.B. Taylor used survival as a tool to explain his culture theory. So survival indicates the condition of the past. Got it? Survival indicates the condition of the past. Sacred, sacred and profane, religion everywhere distinguishes sacred from profane. 
that you can answer right so what makes an object sacred there are few special things right like uh, special prohibitions special prescriptions and uh, one more special is the just I know. And special dispensations. This makes an object a sacred. Special prohibitions means how oh, Tirupati Vengadeshwara is there. Everyone will not be allowed to go and touch Vengadeshwara. A number of special prohibitions. Special prescriptions means how oh, Again, who can go near to him? Who can do what? Okay, so these are uh, special prescriptions. Then special dispensation means, uh, see, morning there will be Suprabhada Puja. For that there will be a special decoration. Then subsequently again next Puja. So the way in which they do it varies, right, these three. But we cannot uh, clearly distinguish between what all these three are. But it is these three, right? special prohibitions, special prescriptions, and special dispensations, which makes something sacred. Which makes something sacred. These three alone, right? Try to remember. Special dispensation, special prescriptions, and special dispensation. These three makes an object sacred. Then... So I said about biogenetic variability among the tribes of Andaman and Nicobar group of islands earlier, long back. They asked to write about the biogenetic variability among the tribes in uh, Northeast India. There you can write some example. The Kasi tribe, uh, Kasi and Jaintia tribe, I think, they are proto -astolites. They are not Mongolites. So there are some changes in that. But in Andaman and Nicobar island, we can make it very, very clear. Very, very clear. There are six important tribes in Andaman and Nicobar island, correct? The Andamanis and Nicobaris, they are protoastrolites. They are protoastrolites. Okay. The Sentinelis and the Jaravas, they both are Negrite. And then no, Shompans and the Wonjis. They are Mongolites. They are Mongolites. So there is a huge question. How it is possible for people belonging to three different races to occupy these remote islands. How it is possible? What made them to reach these distant islands? Ice ages and uh, falling sea level, opening up of uh, continental shelf which made people to migrate here. Okay, fine. So, uh, so biogenetic variability means so variations in the population which are genetic. Okay, so only when these variations are genetic, we can use that as a, a racial criteria. For a criteria to become race, like uh, uh, hair form and texture, skin color, and then a form and shape of nose, 
uh, for these characters to become racial, the first important character is it should be genetic. It should be inherited. Next thing is it should be least influenced by the environment. Okay. So, suppose uh, uh, if somebody from uh, Europe, somebody from Finland, if they come here to Chennai. So, because of the Chennai heat, that they may get a tan in their skin, no doubt. But will they get my color? No, right? So, every character is prone to influence by the environment. Environment influences every single character. But there are few characters which are least influenced by the environment. So, this forms the basis for racial classification. On the other hand, there are few characters which are maximum influenced by the environment. For example, um, body build. Uh, okay, not, a, not about stature. Okay. Uh, few may be endomorph, few may be very, very fat, few may be very lean. Okay. So, uh, one of my friend actually, my schoolmate, she used to be very lean until recently, some 10 years back, right? She used to have too much of pride about being so lean. And suddenly, right, there was one small surgery which needed to be performed in her abdomen and uh, some laparoscopy and uh, fluid accumulation. And then uh, hormonal changes, suddenly now she become like a potato. Okay, so somebody may be from village. Okay, they may work very hard, they may remain very lean, unfit. They may come to a city where within the same generation, right, they may be exposed to junk foods. Once if they start eating uh, uh, biryani, burger, pizza, okay, they will become fat, yes or no. So, this is one character which is maximum influenced by the environment. We cannot use that as a racial criteria. Okay. So, here you can write about the racial characteristics of Andamanis and Nicobar. They are proto acelites Sentinelis and Jaravas, they are Nigra and Nigrat characters. And the Shompans and Rohanjis, they are Mangalites. You can write about some important Mangalite characters. Like uh, this epicanthic fold, this oblique pepper ball fissure, okay, skin color, hair texture and form, everything varies, right? Okay. Next, cultural evolution proponent by Levi's country Morgan say, if you get a question from culture theory, you should not miss that. You should not miss questions from number one, culture theories and then from apes. These are the scoring areas. You may write for entire 250 marks. Still at times right, people end up scoring very poor marks. At times right, a few people they may even miss some 20 marks, 30 marks. Still, they will manage to get very good mark. It is because this type of key questions, right, we should not miss. Okay, any question about culture theory, we are not supposed to take chances. Okay, uh, theory proponent by L.H. Morgan. It is something very simple, right? What he did? The same savagery, barbarism and civilization. He subdivided this into loyal savagery, middle savagery. You know this, right? Then he called this as... Ethnical periods, ethnical periods. Okay, then he also correlated this period with the technological innovations, and even with that, he didn't start. Then he also correlated this with the, the historical and contemporary societies. Okay, then you can after writing this, right? You can write one example. He also dealt with the evolution of marriage as an institution. That six steps. I hope you know about the six steps, right? The first step, early man living in a horde of a sexual promiscuity, where there were no sexual restrictions like animals, right? Anybody can access or anybody for sex. When population increased and when this created conflict, then what next stage, what people did was, they started restating, okay, let us marry within our group, let us marry within our group. So, in the next stage, right, uh, people become endogamous, at the same time, right, even now, uh, brother-sister marriages are practiced. But later, they felt uh, the biological deterioration. So, in the third stage, what they did, they had practiced uh, group marriage, etc., but uh, brother-sister marriages are banned. In the fourth stage, right, uh, loosely paired male and woman, loosely paired male and female, where, right, men had no 
monopoly over the woman. And woman also doesn't mean that he, she needs to pair up only with one man. You are the fourth stage. Fifth stage of uh, male dominated polygamy societies. And sixth one, I will share you the materials, Gaudha. I will share you this material. Okay. And sixth stage is uh, when human culture reached the most civilized stage, it became uh, monogamous. Monogamous. Okay. So this you can write as an example. Then he also discussed how kinship terminology evolved over time, classificated descriptive. Then how political system evolved. For political system, right, he explains that uh, kinship based political system uh, preceded state formation. Then about family type also. So according to him, in the course of evolution, family became smaller, smaller and well contained. Then, okay, you can write these examples also. Okay, fine. Then about uh, rituals of inversion. Uh, have you read about these things? Right D passage. See, right D passage actually marks uh, the transition of an individual from one stage to other stage. For example, the post pubertal right. They will perform it on a girl from uh, childhood to adult, adult stage, that is. Marriage, even that is a right D passage. Okay, from bachelorhood, right, they become a married couple now. But uh, uh, rituals of inversion is something different actually. See, we have made, we have codified number of rules and laws, etc. And these are always so difficult for us to follow only. For example, if you go to Singapore, I'll tell you, oh my God. Uh, the way in which they follow the rules with uh, the amount of uh, precision, right, nobody will follow. Okay. Even if nobody is there in the road, People will not cross the road even the zebra crossing until the signal becomes green. Okay. To that extent, everything was codified there, but even in Singapore, we have Indian quarters where none of these rules apply there. You can run in the road, you can jump the median. No. <laughs> even in Singapore, we have the Indian quarters. Okay. So, we have made all the rules of, about the society, everything, which makes our life so tough. So tough. We all made this rule largely because we need to live in a harmony. Rules related to marriage also, monogamy. All these things are practicing because to minimize the conflict. But it provides a stress for us. And uh, biologically, we are not designed to live in this way. So these rituals of inversion are found in uh, many societies. For example, in the Mediterranean Europe, they have the carnival. So during carnival, right, we'll be there for uh, one week or ten days. So during this time, right, people will be left free. There will be no rules. In family, right, parents will not ask if the girls, the daughter come back late. Nightclubs will be open uh, till early morning. And the public display of affection will be allowed there. So nobody will question anyone. They are left free, actually. After... Uh, uh, once when the carnival ends, then people need to return back to the normal life. Normal life. This is one example for rituals of inversion. There are many such things even in our own society. In our during our school days, huh? It's a, huh? It's a, what is that ceremony? I don't know. Uh, Uprana Sangara. Uh, that is a right deep passage actually. That's a right deep passage. That marks a transition from uh, uh, childhood to Brahmacharya Ashrama. So these are rituals of inversion where the rules get inverted. Earlier it was a restriction. Now there are no such rules. In our school, they say Christian missionary school, what they used to do once in a year, uh, there will be one occasion on which, right, uh, all our teachers will come, perfect need to come to school, but there will be no classes on that day. There will be only stalls there. You can bring money, you can just chit chat with the people, you can just uh, uh, speak, you can play there whatever you want, you can get that, you can get those sweets or whatever they are stalled, you can eat that. And on those days, right, even those teachers who used to be very strict and rude, they will be so kind and cordial. But they will remain like that only for that day. Next day again they will become strict. There is one book written by uh, one author in uh, TM, Perumal Murugan. I have heard about uh, his writing. That is one part two month. It is one part two month. In that book, right, he mentions about one rituals of inversion. So there is one temple in the Euro district of uh, TN, uh, 
Arthanadeshwara temple that is the nurse excurt. There he mentions about one particular ritual. It was there even many other literature mentions about that actually. So in, after marriage a girl may not conceive. The problem may be from the boy's side. So if it prolongs right it creates a lot of social stress for them. So there will be one particular festival uh, maybe once in six months I think in this temple. On the day right everyone gathers there in the temple. The most of the people who couldn't conceive and they will be there. From evening there will be a number of rituals and night right beyond 8 or 9 o'clock the rules will be completely relaxed. Any woman there can sleep with any man. At, so next day when they go back to their home the belief is that they will be carrying a baby. These are examples of rituals of uh, inversion. But he published that book man, that's it. All the fundamentalist organizations only from Bajrantal and these people because that is a case in TN there are few uh, few writers uh, who wrote many many things like these actually. Only with the advent of uh, BJP they write these things are starting actually. <laughs> now BJP couldn't penetrate but uh, through funds at least these RSS operatives, Bajrantal, they are becoming so popular there right. Uh, they have issued lot of death threat to this person and he said that Perman Murugan writer is dead, I will take back all my books. But to show solidarity for his writing, the same month there was one uh, conference which was held there in Germany about uh, uh, books, fiction workers etc. There continuously on uh, cyclic basis right, people read verses from his book uh, non-stop, non-stop to show solidarity with uh, this writer. Okay, fine then. After, uh, then discuss briefly the policy measures formulated by Indian government to, to deal with the illiteracy among the tribes. So for illiteracy right, what we can write, we have ashrama schools, pre-matrix scholarship, post-matrix scholarship, then we also have this, uh, uh, that one, we have tribal universities now, then we also have these uh, hostel facilities for the tribes in the district sectors, this we can write, okay. Then now, uh, Discuss briefly the presence of shaman and priest in your society. I told you it's going to be over. No, 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 no. So everything is fine. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. So I asked you to discuss about the economics behind the presence of a shaman and a priest in your society. See, if we have if we have shaman, if shaman is there in a particular society, the meaning is those people are not capable of producing economic surplus. They are not capable of producing economic surplus. That's why they cannot have a full-fledged temple where if there is a temple, then they need to man it with a number of priests whose occupation will only be to deal with the temple and the God. He is expected to maintain at most level of purity, pollution, etc. And he didn't differentiate himself from the rest of the people. He didn't know about the nuances of the religion and various dogmas. It's not an ordinary thing. But there are societies where people cannot produce economic surplus, say for hunters and gatherers or marginal cultivators. When they do not have economic surplus, then they will have shaman. So shaman is a part-time specialist. He will be having some other activity. He may be doing agriculture or he may be doing fishing. But this guy will have some extra knowledge about the rituals of dogmas, etc. And once when there is a religious occasion, he will go there, he will officiate the event, he will get paid and he will go back and do his personal activity. He is a shaman. So shamans are found in society where they do not have economic surplus. On the other hand, uh, the Chola temples. Uh, have you heard about the town uh, Kumbagono? If at all, if we have any problem in our stars, they will send us to Kumbagono. There are close to around uh, 60 large sized temples, uh, every temple right will cover an area of uh, at least some 4 or 5 acres, huge huge temples, I will show you a few examples, I have seen the Bragadishwara temple, I have heard about it, This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, okay. The one in the top, this uh, Vimana we say. This is, uh, this way some uh, 8 ton, okay. And 1000 years back, this is a monolith. 
what technology they had to lift this to this height and to keep it over there. They have made an inclination for 17 kilometers it seems. And using elephants, they pulled it to keep it on the top. To keep it on the top. This, but this is still an unfinished temple. It's an unfinished temple, this is Radhikara temple. So this is uh, the Nadraja temple of uh, Chitambara. See how huge these temples are. Okay. I mean, this has a history of 1500 years. See, this is this one right in the middle now. Some thousand years back, uh, they have made a golden roof. How it is possible for them to make such a huge temple? So fertile was the Kaveri Delta. Do you know when the first dam was constructed across Kaveri River? Can you guess? First dam across Kaveri River. 280. 2000 years back, Karigala Chora, he constructed a dam across Kaveri River. He called us Kalanai, Greater Anakat, that is still under use. After some reinforcement, it is still under use. That is one of the oldest uh, serving civil structure in the world. Oldest civil structure to be still in use. 2000 years back. And there is a saying that these people to thrash the paddy. They used the elephants. Elephants to thrash the um, thrashing floor. They used the elephants to thrash. So that was the wealth of the Kaveri Delta. That is what made them so powerful to construct these many temples. So construction of the temple is not sufficient. Management, maintenance becomes a very big issue. These temples will be endowed with a few hundred acres of land. And about this particular temple, about Chitambaran temple, there is one saying, that means a girl who is born in this town will not move away from the town. So you know what happened? Once when the temple was finished, the Chola rulers, they endowed this temple with huge wealth and they gave the temple administration to some 10 or 15 related Brahmin families. They, right, they didn't want to lose the right over the property as well as temple administration. So they become strictly endogamous. Okay, if you get your girl married to some boy, he will come, he will say, I will become the temple priest. Things are diluted, right? So they have become strictly endogamous. They kept marrying among themselves, themselves, themselves to keep the property and authority also with them. Until some 10 years back, even the TN government couldn't appoint one endowment officer into the temple. There was a long case for 30 years and finally they own it now. So now they managed to keep on endowment officer inside the temple to look over the temple administration and finances. See, so they have made such a huge temples largely because of the wealth, surplus production. So when you have temple and priest, surplus production is the, uh, is the criteria. So this is the difference between having sorcerer and uh, a priest. But see how things are changing now. I told you shaman is their part-time specialist. Priest is a full-time specialist. Okay. Uh, some three years back, I was there in Hyderabad for a work. I was there for one week. There's one very famous temple, Skandagiri Kathikaya temple. I went there. And that part, that uh, priest who was uh, officiating the rituals, right? Uh, I've seen this guy somewhere. I have seen this guy somewhere. Then he came and he gave all the prasad, everything. Then after some time, when he became free, I went to him and said, I am 100% sure I have met you somewhere. Then he asked me, did you come to State Bank of India today? Yes sir, I came. I am the cashier there, man. <laughs> now priesthood becomes a part-time occupation. So how things, that, that's why culture is dynamic. Culture keeps changing. We cannot talk, conserve the culture. Okay. <coughs> then about Lucy, to try to explain. I give you materials for Lucy, right? Did I give you Kiran the materials for these things? I'll forward it to him. If not, right, you forward. I'll just drop the message in the group then. Okay. Lucy is Australopithecus uh, Africans. Okay. We call Lucy as uh, the mother of grandmother, not a grandmother of humankind. Because 
It was the first human ancestor fossil in which at least 40 percentage of the remains were intact. I will show you one picture of Barack Obama glancing up. I showed you earlier, right? Obama and uh, Lucy. See, the Guardian published this. Is it visible to you? Is it visible? I shall enlarge this. So. See how Obama was uh, glancing the Lucy. Obama's mother is an uh, anthropologist. During his uh, last few years as president, right, he went to Ethiopia for an official trip where he, after going there, he asked the officials, I want to meet Lucy. And they said, sir, you be here, we will bring Lucy here. <laughs> and even before leaving, once again, right, he said, no, I want to see Lucy again. They brought it again, it seems. Mother of humankind. Her grandmother of humankind, at least 40% of the skeletal remains are still intact in Lucy. Okay. And even there are many theories that says how what was responsible for Lucy's death. Lucy is the young female. And Lucy sustained injuries due to a fall from a tree and she died because of that. Okay, Lucy. And then uh, uh, tribal land alienation. Tribal land alienation. So, you can write a good essay about that, right? So, the reasons for land alienation, you wrote it actually, reason for land alienation, like uh, the most important reason is money lenders. Money lenders. And here, we can write about uh, one process, the process of uh, peasantization and depeasantization, which operated simultaneously in the society or uh, the tribal society. Presentization and depresentization. Yeah, earlier the tribes were living there in the jungles peacefully. It is we, right, for our selfishness, we made them to come out of the jungles. So, for example, Jahangir. Jahangir was the first to do this thing actually. So he encouraged a few tribes in the Tarai region to clear the forest and he brought it under cultivation. So they are living there in the mountains, the jungles. We made them to come down, clear the jungle and do agriculture. So this is called as peasantization. And once when they do that right down, then the money lenders will go there. You know to what extent they will cheat them? Their kids, right, may be longing for bicycle. They will know this weakness. Say, so you need bicycle, right? Come here. Nothing, you just stop. Keep your fingerprint here. This is sufficient. You take this bicycle. Yeah. Sir, that's all. You are giving me this bicycle. That's all. Only for this. Then he will take the bicycle. He will run to the village and say, there is one great man there. I just kept my thumb in person. That's it. He gave me one cycle. Like, go, go, run, run, run. They all don't know what's going to happen to them in the future. And I have few friends from Assam. They used to say, when the Marwadi is went there for trading, you know, to what extent they should cheat them. They used to say one meter, they used to indulge in textile trade. They say one meter cloth costs 200 rupees. Say, Sir, it is very costly. How very costly it is. Can you just make it uh, 150 rupees or 100 rupees? Then after the negotiation, they say, okay, 100 rupees. So then he will measure the same piece of cloth. One meter, two, three, four. Four meters, 400 rupees. The earlier they might have bought it for 200. <laughs> See, to the text and right, they were uh, mercilessly exploited, okay. So, uh, money lenders, then uh, this process, uh, then uh, uh, project affected peoples again, okay. Project affected peoples, multi-purpose projects and uh, land alienation, okay. So, we can write about all these things and then even about the recent legislation like this resettlement of, uh, what is that act? Relocation of resettlement of, uh, that act we can write about this then apart from that uh, about the transformation of tribal lands there are many state government related laws about uh, a transfer of a tribal lands to non-tribal people there are restrictions in that also okay so like that you can make some uh, you can uh, add some legislations here okay fine i think that's all we are done with uh, this question okay so for our next test uh, shall we have the pre-test discussion tomorrow Hmm? You'll be free tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, somewhere by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. After lunch, you can come, right? Okay.
one second, I will uh, just 